that. Oh, um, I'm, I'm going to be driving today and uh, presenting a Joel Freeman, who has been with the plan since the beginning, I think about six or seven years now. Joel's the president.
because this part of this is for all of you. I, I myself, well, I'm, I am a law professor. I play one at television as well. I also have a role in law school as the head of technology, so I wear that administrative hat at the very same time. And, and one of the things that was helpful to me about Westlaw is 60% of what I'm going to show you, you could do yourself on your own servers at your law school. But of course, you'd have to have the servers. You'd have to dedicate the space on your servers. You'd have to have the staff to monitor it, to update it, to do all the stuff that goes along with it, to have all of this data going through your intranet, you know, clogging up, you know, which should save space that should be saved for other important things like email. Uh, and anyway, you could only do 60%. And plus, you'd have to have, have the person power, which is people and time and money, to do this. The beauty of this is, from, from my vantage point as the administrator to lay for uh, technology stuff, I have nothing to do with it. The professor creates a course on Twin. That's between him and the internet. All that stuff is housed on these humongous, humongous servers up there in, in Minnesota. And Tulane also has nothing to do with it. So it's accessible by and for the students 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for wherever they are in the world, as long as they have a connection to the internet. So now, in, in, instead of talking kind of in the, in the abstract terms, let me give you an idea of what it looks like. What happens is a professor creates a course, and then the students who are in that course register for the course. The creation of the course, which I'll show you a little bit about, takes three minutes, and you have the entire course. All of all of its components can be configured and reconfigured and added, subtracted. I'll show you a little bit of that. I'm not going to waste a whole lot of your time going through the, the specifics because it, it's, it's very, very simple and you'll be able to do it by yourself. But, but the place to start, this looks different. Is this something different? Is this is lawschool.westlaw.com. This is the secondary page. Okay, going back to lawschool.westlaw.com. All right. This is kind of the, the first page that you go to when you start. Now, as it turns out, there's a whole lot of stuff you can do here that doesn't relate specifically to TWIN, that also relates to Westlaw, because as I said, TWIN and Westlaw are integrated. For example, you can do some Westlaw research here. Can you scroll down a little bit, Justin? You can do some Westlaw research uh, from this page if you want to. We don't have a... Um, uh, well, that's okay. Um, anyway, you can do a, a bunch of stuff here. I, I don't want to waste your time talking about it, but if you go up there where you see Twin, you click on that, and that'll take you into Twin. Now, obviously, once you've created a course, you can bookmark that course. You don't have to bother going through here. Thank you. You going to show me how to use this? I'm not. <laughs> technologically uh, advanced, but that just shows you, you don't have to be to use this thing. Uh, I, when, I, you know, when I say I've been involved in the beginning from the design, that's true. I don't do any of the science, as you can imagine. I mean, I couldn't possibly. But it's, it's the creation of it and, and how it should work that the two of us, uh, Nichols and I, came up with. And that's important because we know what law school teaching is about. These engineers at West or these other companies who are just technical people, they're wonderful at what they do, but they don't know how to teach law school courses. And teaching at law school is different than teaching a math course to undergraduates. Okay. Come on. Oh, okay. I got it. So, put in your Westlaw password, which you have to do. You click go. And you're going to get into uh, Twin. Um, you know what would be even better? Can you go back and put in my password yeah. so we can see uh, my stuff? That would be too bad. Three, two, three. One, three, six. Three, two, three. One, three, two, three, one, three, six. V, C, P, R. This guy will not leave the company tomorrow. <laughs> and he's the project manager. 
Well, drugs mine instead here, so it's not Can't be. Or beta. No, then go get me to the get me to the regular one. No, I need get your class. No, no, I, no. I want to be on my. This class is right. Okay. All right. Fine. You can. It, we've already added a whole lot of courses. This damn thing doesn't work either. We've added a whole bunch of courses here. Okay. But I want to show you just from the beginning how you you would add a course, uh, and and for those in the library. This is particularly useful for the research or writing courses that you'll see in a while. Create a course up here. Now you're the professor, you want to create a course. So let's click on that. I'm not going to go through the whole process because it because it's a waste of our time. Okay. But it's like a typical Windows kind of application. There's a wizard and there are steps. And the little green thing changes when you go through the various steps. But basically what this does, uh, we've configured it as a default to create a certain number of options to you start off right away, the ones that most people use. Now obviously, if you want to, you don't have to take the defaults. You can add, you can subtract, change the names of things when you first create the course or thereafter. Now let's go back to the prior page. Let's go back to my course. You end up with a course. Uh, last fall, I taught civil procedure. Okay, that this hopefully is actually my course. No, it's not. Okay, shut it down and start again. Uh, I apologize for this. This guy will be fired tomorrow. Um, when we create a course, basically what we do is create what I call forums or or document pages. And, and part of what this is, is, is a way of communicating between you and the students and the students to communicate one to each other, whether it's in the form of a discussion forum or the dissemination of materials. Um, it's a very uh, rich set of offerings which are totally configurable uh, at your pleasure. Um, and, and, and if you could imagine seeing it, if we would get this thing to work, it would be a very beautiful thing. Here we go. There you go. You create a course. I didn't bother showing you the whole business, but when you create a course, it asks you your name and your email address, and you, and you create a course home page. And it creates it based on the information you provided. For example, there was an option for me to put little data here about when my class is meeting, so I put that there. I didn't have to. I could have put a whole bunch of stuff you know, a bunch of text here. I just put a little nothing here. Uh, over there where it says modify this course page, in that white area, don't click on that. In that white area, you have the option for putting in a picture, and there it is. Uh, I did. Those are my children. Uh, Karen, it's, it's a pathetic attempt to ingratiate myself with the students. It's a pathetic. And you saw through it immediately. You said, come on, who's this guy who he is? Pretending that he's a human being. It's pathetic, but you know, you do what you have to do. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you can also put some kind of a, a WAV file here, but I wasn't that, you know, excited about it. This is the guts of the course, huh? and this, this little navigation stuff stays with you wherever you go. But this is the guts of the course, and, and I'm going to discuss a whole bunch of these places within the course. Some of these are created by default, but you can eliminate all the ones that are created by default, create your own, change the names, do it as you will. You'll notice that they are not arranged in alphabetical or seemingly any meaningful order. When you, when, when you initially create it, they're arranged in alphabetical order. But for years I thought that was kind of silly. I prefer to have the one on top that I use the most, and then the second one, and the ones that I use the least on the bottom. And we now have this thing called arranged links, which, if you want to click, uh, where you can just change the order of these things. Uh, it's obvious. You can imagine how simple it is. You just boom, there, there. Let's just hit the back button. And um, it puts them in any order you want. I like. I happen to like them in this order. Let's show you a couple of things that I've done. One is my discussion forum. Let's open that up. Um, what this is essentially is a threaded list serve, uh, where the students are invited to, to post things, 
uh, uh, and typically talk amongst themselves. What I tell my students is use this like an electronic study group. Uh, and I have created categories by subject area diversity of citizenship form. These are all subjects in the civil procedure. Uh, and I can create as many of these or as few of these as I want, and I can add in the middle of the semester and subtract and do all that. It's all of that stuff, uh, if you just scroll down a little bit, you can um, change during the semester by going down here to, whoa, whoa, big guy, whoa, big guy. Okay. Modify course, okay? And then you can change all of that. Um, is there not just an easy scroll thing? Not this piece. Okay, well, Karen, clean this up. <laughs> all right. Um, well, first of all, one of the things you can see is there's an incredible amount of postings. I make this totally optional for my students. They can use twin, they cannot use twin. It's totally up to them. I, I don't know what they're doing. I tell them, if it's helpful to you, use it. If it's not helpful to you, don't use it, because I do this for you. Uh, <coughs> and the idea here is, typically what happens, if you can just scroll up a little bit, a student will make a posting, what the hell did Friedman mean yesterday in class when he said thus and so and thus and so? And it's threaded in the sense, I'm going to try this again, I know it's not going to work. Ah! The battery just Lexus huh? probably made this thing. This is okay. Anyway, it's threaded in the sense. Everybody know what threaded means? Anybody not know what threaded means? Would you like this, Joe? He gets a big sound. He believes in much more. Can you show me that? So this posting, huh, is a response to this posting. This posting is a response to this posting. This posting is back response to here. So typically a student will say, what did he say? And then one student will say, well, I think he said so-and-so. And another say, well, I think he said so-and-so. And, -so. and what I do is I ask the students, and they have the option to post anonymously or with their name, because when they register with their password, we know who, what their name is. And I ask them to post anonymously because one of the reasons I do this is I find uh, I know this wouldn't be true at Suffolk, but at Tulane Law School, not every student wants to participate in every class every day, all of the time. Shockingly, but true. Uh, you know, even though we're a private school, my students say, no, I have a constitutional right to remain silent. Uh, they're afraid, they're, I don't know what. But if they can post it anonymously, it kind of frees them up. And they actually feel more emboldened and ready to participate. Uh, and so I ask them to post anonymously, and they do. And I never ever have a problem with people saying bad things or nasty things or mean things or anything like that because I just tell them my brother they didn't. Uh, they seem to. Now, if, if he could scroll down a little bit, you, from time to time, and you don't see it very much, I will jump in. If I think they're way, way off the mark, I'll jump in. Now, what this is, of course, this is not the posting itself. I mean, just look here, for example. I don't know what this is. Let's open this one up. Diversity jurisdiction? Yeah. I don't know what it is, but okay, this is, this is a typical size of a student's uh, posting. Obviously, we talked about diversity jurisdiction that day, and I didn't do a good job because the student was confused and they, they asked a question. If we could just go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go. But what's interesting is you can see the length of the uh, thread, huh? This one responded to this one, this one responded to this one, and it went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So they got into it. Um, now, it could be that some of these anonymous are the same person. Maybe number three and number one are the same. I don't know. It's possible. I don't know. But you can see, and if we scroll down, you can see about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of postings. And in fact, this is only one third of the postings in the semester because after a while, now scroll up to the top, please, they get so many postings, it just gets a pain to scroll. So what we can do is we can put these into an archive. Uh, yeah, we don't need to do that, just go back. It's very easy, you just, there's a button that you push, and that goes into an archive, it's still there, 
so people can look at it if they enter the archive. But then it's kind of like a clean slate when they start posting again. So, don't do anything. This is the discussion forum, and I say it's mostly used for students. Uh, sometimes it will be students asking questions to each other. Sometimes at the end of class, uh, as I did long before tonight, I would say, well, tomorrow we're going to discuss this and so, and here are two questions I want you to think about. We'll discuss them next time. And of course, students wouldn't think one second about it before next time, and I'm not going to think about it when I ask them in class next time. But now what they do, uh, and not because I force them, because it's totally voluntary, I say, you know, talk about this, you know, discuss it amongst yourselves before class, and they will, in fact, have a discussion on Twin about that question that I asked. Uh, which actually is very good, helpful to me, because by the time we come to class that day, and I ask the question, many of them, I don't want to pretend to all of them, but many of them have pre-digested the material, and already talked it through to the point where we don't have to start all the way down here, maybe we can start a little bit over here, you know, and, and then we'll go a little bit higher than we might otherwise have gone in class. So I have found that this has not only, um, uh, embolden more students to participate in class because they've done so here, but it also heightens the level of discussion in class because they've already kind of pre-digested it down. And, and it's amazing that when students participate in this, particularly when they respond to some other students posting, and they get some positive feedback, and they're like, yeah, wow, that's really good, blah, 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 blah. That makes them feel good about themselves. It, it, they weren't afraid propose an answer because nobody knew who they were, so there was no fear there. And then when they get positive feedback, I think that translates into confidence. And, they, and I've had many students say, you know, I never participated in class, but you know, after a while I did this twin thing, and so I gave it a shot, and then when I said in class you didn't call me names, and so it was okay. Um, how you post. Let's hit post a message. Because this is kind of cool. We're going to see the new thing. Excellent. Now, this is true regardless of which of these forms we discuss, and I'll discuss a few more of them later. But basically, uh, as you see, if you could just sh sh click down on this drop down list so they can see my drop down list of categories, I created a whole bunch of categories. So they can choose whichever one it fits in. It makes it easier to read these postings if they fit into a category, huh? And as I said, I can add and subtract throughout the semester. I ask them to post anonymously, so they got to check that off. And then they type in, doesn't matter, the title of their posting, you know, Sleepless in Seattle, whatever it is. And then, if you just go down, I'll just um, they can, if they want to just type something, and typically for students when they post, they're just typing right there on the fly. So they type here, but you can see, this is, a, this is an advance over what we typed before. We've been waiting for this for a long time. This is a very cool thing. Now it looks like a real word processor. I mean, you can bold, you can underline, you can italicize, you can do all of this cool stuff. And when you do it, and then you send it, it keeps the formatting 100%. You've created the document in twin, if you do it this way. Colors, all of that kind of stuff. Huh? But the, the best part is the, the is kind of formatting of bold and underline and italics and, and, and all the stuff you're familiar with in Microsoft Word. So, for, typically for students, that's how they're going to do it. They're, gonna, they're just going to type a little something. But, when professors post something, whether it's in this form or typically some other forms, like a, a, a case, a new materials form, right? A new Supreme Court case comes out or something else like that, and I want to post something that I've created, for example, in a Word document. So, I will find the file by browsing my hard drive. You know what happens. You click this thing and it shows you the directory of your hard drive. You find the file you're talking about. You click on it and it attaches here. It could be a Word file. It could be an Excel spreadsheet. It could be a Wave thing. It could be a GIF. It could be, you name it, whatever it is. Now, here's the very cool thing. As you can imagine, I don't know how to do anything other than send an email and do a document. But in order for you to, I know enough to know that in order to see something on the internet in a browser, that thing has to be in a different format than Microsoft Word is, and that's what they call HTML. I know the, the tech people here, this is obvious. But believe me, most professors don't know what HTML is, don't know what it stands for, and we certainly don't want to have to make up any HTML or something. 
can change Microsoft Word to HTML, do any of that kind of stuff. And you don't have to. Whether it's a PowerPoint or an Excel or whatever it is, you attach it here, and if you click this button, when you, when you press the Submit button, it sends that document up to Wes. I don't know how, but somehow they have these converters that automatically convert that document, whether it's a Word document or a search tool, whatever it is, into HTML. So that when somebody opens it up, they don't have to open up an application and download the file. It's there, and they can read it, and you've done it. And there's nothing that I have to do to make that happen other than to select the document that I created in the one application I know how to use, which is a word process like that. If you didn't do that, if you unclicked that button, then all that would happen is you'd have a posting, and, you, and I'll show you one, where you would just see the name of the document in blue and underlined. What that would require the students to do is to click on that, download that document into their hard drive, then open up the application on their hard drive and view it. I mean, sometimes I guess some people want to do that. I find that to be a pain because that requires all the students to have all the applications that you want to create documents and sometimes they don't. And, it, and I don't see any reason to do that. I much prefer to do it that way. Does it From the original document? Yeah. Um, what would you attach to the HTML though? It converts as best it can. If there's things like tabs and spaces, it's going to miss some of them why we came up with the editing tool like this. So if there are some discrepancies as to what you see on your original document and online, you can modify those to make them match. Through here without going back to the native application. Then we'll just we'll bypass that and we'll say you already did the work and we'll display it for you. For those who like me don't understand what he just asked and what the answer was. Sometimes when you create a document in a basic application and, and West or whomever transforms it into HTML, you lose some of the formatting. Uh, and that's because a West, like most companies, they buy from some other company a conversion program which converts X into HTML. And none of those conversion programs are very good. Uh, so they've got whatever the best ones are, but they're not yet perfect. So they're kind of at the mercy of the companies conversion. So it's the best that's available, but it's not perfect. But if it's not so good, so you then you look at it in here, and then you can fix it up in here with these simple kinds of things. Now, that's a, it's a long document that you don't want to have to test with editing. Is there a way around that? Make it into HTML again. Or can you save it as like a rich text format instead of a word or a rich text? Isn't that HTML will keep the format? We'll do a better job with it. It's, it's still not I'm going to show you one in a second, okay? If I can, just before I do that. One of the other things that is nice here, if you want to, uh, if you click this one where it says send an email message, what I can, if I click that, then as soon as I post something, an email message is sent to every student who is registered in my course, and I don't put the student's names, and that's done automatically. Uh, it sends an email saying, Professor Friedman has now posted something in the discussion forum. If you want to see it, click here. You click there, and it opens up, you know, Internet Explorer or Netscape, and it opens up Twin, and it gets them exactly to the place once they put in their website question. And that's good, because then students like to know that. I, I do not post anonymously. I figure, maybe wrongly, that when I post, they probably want to know that it's me, not one of them. Um, okay. If we can just scroll up a little. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, you say you want the students to post anonymously. Yes. Do you have the option of requiring them also? Do whatever you want. But I mean, in the sense of the program, because most of what you just tell in class, if that post anonymously, low box always come out. Yes. Now, you, you can disable that. Oh, if you want right. to have a post yeah, anonymously right. come up, you don't. It's in your forums options, how you set up your different areas of your class. Right. You can enable a, a password or a, you can enable anonymous like this as well. But when it's marked as post anonymously, does that mean that nobody? Just the other students, you can tell who it is through your usage statistics. There's there's an area of the class where you can see how much your students are using different areas of the class. Yeah, but would you be able to set it up so, I mean, lots of students are perfectly comfortable coming up after class and asking the professor a question, but they're afraid of doing it in class and they want to be embarrassed in that setting. Uh, there's some advantage, it seems to me, to being able for the professor to know who is asking the question and come in, even though no other students know. 
not directly from the farm out right now. Okay. Now, they could obviously send you an email. Yeah. Uh, but no, uh, and, and I think, I, I hear what you're saying. I prefer not to know. And, I, and what's more important, since I told the students it's anonymous, I want them to have confidence that it is anonymous. I'm not suggesting you tell them one thing. Yeah, no, 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 I understand. No, I understand. But, well, no, that there is a certain value in that I think about it. Okay. There you go. Um, let me show you quickly practice problems, which is a this is not one of the default forms that's created, but one that I created. It took me about two seconds to do it when you go through the create the course uh, wizard thing. Again, it looks the same kind of thing, but what I do uh, at in the semester is this is a first year course for semester first year course. We don't have midterms, we don't have papers, we don't have anything. It's the final exam, the final course rate is based. 100% on the final exam, no credit for participation, everything's anonymous, all of that stuff. So first year, first year semester students are freaked out because, you know, they don't know how to take a final exam and everything is based on the final exam. So what I do is throughout the semester I will post very short, and we can open this up if you want, third problem, since obviously the third one I did that semester. I mean really very short hypos. There are many, many hypos. Can you click back? It doesn't matter what's that, that, what is this? And then I invite the students to post written answers. And I promise them that any student who posts an answer will get a written critique from me. Now, because of the nature of this, every student can see my problem. Every student can see every other student's answer. And every student can see my critique of every student's answer. Which, of course, is not anonymous in the sense that I wrote it, but I don't know to whom I'm writing. This one, women I've been looking at, obviously wasn't a very good one. Uh, as you can tell from the title, no, don't open it. Uh, this one probably was a little bit better. Um, now, what's interesting about this is, you notice that in this, pro I had 80 students. You only see about, what, 10, maybe less? Students actually tried to do it. Now, if you go scroll down, probably more did the second one, and even more did the first one. But still, nothing like 80. Then you would think, they would do this, wouldn't they? I mean, here they have the opportunity, and the students tell me they love this because they get a free chance to write a short answer. It gets graded, kind of, by the guy who's going to grade their final exam. It doesn't count. It's anonymous. They have nothing to lose, everything to gain. They're freaking out for a semester. They don't know the Why don't they all do it? And I asked myself that many times. Then I decided, no point asking myself, I asked them, and maybe I would get an answer. Well, it's interesting. Students think that they learn differently. And obviously there are different ways of learning. Typically the, what the students say to me is, this was very important. But you know, I saw your question. I saw how 20 students give an answer, and I saw how each of them was good or bad. I, I got it. I know. Now, whether they can in fact learn passively like that as opposed to actively, I'm not confident. But again, I do this for them. I sound like my mother. <laughs> Uh, so if they find it useful, so so be it. I'm, I'm just trying to help. I mean, you know, I live to serve. So um, I wish more would do it. It doesn't take a whole lot of time. You can see the question is very short. So the answers typically are not very long. With all modesty, I, I've figured out the answer by now to these questions. And after reading them 10 or 20 times, the reading of the answer and, and saying a few pithy and hopefully humorous and worthwhile remarks, that whole process takes me about three minutes per one of their answers. So it doesn't take me very long to do this. Uh, and they just think this is great. I mean, I actually get in my course evaluations two words that until recently I never heard a Tulane student pay $26,000 a year say, thank you. These are not words known in the, in the lexicon, but they really appreciate this. And I think it's a very helpful thing for them. So that's my practice problems. Now, it used to be that this was the only way you could create forms, this kind of list thing where you would create a document and first you'd see a list of all of the postings and you'd have to open up each one. But over the years we heard from uh, faculty as I went across the country talking about this and said, you know, this is good, but I'd like to remove one step. I'd like to open up a forum and see the document right away without seeing the list. So we decided we would create that and we called it a document page. Uh, don't open any of them yet. And I've got a few of them here. For example, course materials 
is an obvious one. And by the way, and I should have said it, uh, well, let's open up Course Introduction. Course Introduction is one of these document pages. And it so happens I only have one document in there. And it's one, I don't want to know, it's called Course Introduction. This is a document that I created in Microsoft Word. It's the only thing I can use. And I created this many years ago. And it's simply a, um, a, an explanation of what the course is going to be about, which is, you know, before there were computers, I typed out and I put on the bulletin board, you know, and there were 80 students looking at their scribbling notes, you know, surrounded by each other, pay pockets and all that. Now I post it. Um, and and this, is exact, this is how it looks when I sent it up in, you know, course introduction dot dot from Microsoft Word, and it came back like this. That's not a very fancy thing, but it does show you a couple of things. First of all, I started typing, I started typing, and then I typed, anybody who's had to go through civil procedure will never forget the name of this case, uh, Pernod versus Neff, and so I typed out Pernod versus Neff, comma, 95 U.S. 714, and I kept typing on my very way. Don't do it. But, you, but when it went up to West, and they made it into HTML. Uh, they, I don't know how this happens, but their program knows that when it sees a citation, it automatically makes it into a hypertext link. I don't have to tell it to do that. I don't have to put any little syntax in front of it. I just do it. And so you can, and, and so it turns it into blue, and it underlines it. And you know what's going to happen. I won't waste your time. But if we clicked on this, it would open up Westlaw. And it would open up the universe and then we'd be right there. And it would take half a second. Similarly, you see I go on to talk about we will move to the mysteries of service of process. A subject that gives new meaning to the Dylan-esque notion that in the end we all gotta serve somebody. Now all people like me and others in this room know what this means, but my students have no idea what that means. They don't even know what Dylan means. But you know, this, this is also blue and underlined. Let's give this a whirl, uh, Justin. We click that. And, uh, no, it's the, it, well, click, go back. If you just put your cursor under it, what that is, is a link to this web page. This is a Bob Dylan page that has the, the, uh, the, uh, the words to, we all gotta serve somebody. Try it again. Maybe it just was. No. It's, uh, part of the problem, by the way, of linking to the internet is sometimes these things go away. You know, and you want something that's there yesterday, it's you know, it, you know, it's gone. Uh, this one's been there for a long time. I think there's just some screwy going on. Uh, now, I, I have to be honest. Only in, at this point, otherwise I wouldn't. Be. I didn't just type, "quote We all got to serve somebody," and somehow West knew how to find the web page, and it happened like that. That didn't happen. Had I simply typed whatever that URL is, you know, www.dylan.whatever, it would have then, it would have seen that, it would have made it into a hypertext link, and it would have made it into blue and underlined. But that would have given it away, and I wanted it to appear to be cool. because So I hid the URL, right? It's underneath, you can't see it. This is what we call an anchor tag. I don't know why they call it an anchor tag, but they do. Now, in this case, I did have to type in a little syntax before the www. Uh, and if you go to help, which we won't do now, you find exactly how to do that. It's, it's very simple. I can't remember now. I haven't done it in a while. But it's in a few little letters. You do the www thing, and then whatever you want it to say. And then it makes it cool like this. Um, maybe this won't work. I then, I then try again to show that I'm a human being who knows more than law, I refer to Scylla and Charybdis. There you go. So you see, that web page, you know, just because law students, you know, maybe they know, maybe they don't. So again, and you see I've got Erie Railroad case here, or Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. If I clicked on this, which you won't, it would take us into Westlaw for the Federal Rules of Procedure dealing with joint your parties and claims. We, let's see if Golden Fleece is working just for fun of it. No one's having fun with me. But... Uh oh, uh oh, oh! You see? I wonder what happened here. Click on this one. I wonder what happened. They changed it, huh? Son of a gun! 
Yeah, well, but they were kind enough at least to tell us, not that other Bob Dylan page, which was actually somewhere in Japan. Um, well, so the point I'm trying so obliquely to make through all of this is that you can post not just text or other documents, but inside those things, create extremely simply by just typing the citation a link to anything in Westlaw. I mean, cases, articles, you know, all the newspaper stuff that they have. I mean, it's a black hole, Westlaw, right? Nobody knows what's in there. There's just a billion things in there. And in addition, you can create links very simply or in a more sophisticated way to anywhere on the internet, boom, just like that. You don't have to know anything. It's obvious I did it. And it's not a very big deal. And while that tends to be done more by professors than students, I, interestingly, Sometimes I'll have postings by students as somebody asks a question and the student says, you know, I don't know how I found it, but I just happened to find a case right on point, and they'll say, you know, 39 F third, so and so, and they'll share. Or they'll find something in Business Week or you know, Forbes or something that they also found in Westlaw, and they'll put the little URL there and, and students will show it to each other. It's kind of cool. Okay. Well, you can imagine you can do the same thing with a list of course materials. One of Steve Nichols, the guy I was telling you the course on this, he has a whole course that's on the web. No book, no hard text, no nothing. His whole course is on the web, and what he has are links to all the cases. Either the cases right in Westlaw, or cases that he's put in there in an edited form that are up there on the server that they can have access to. Uh, so there's a whole lot of stuff. The area which I teach, upper class employment discrimination, coming all the time. It's a very helpful thing to be able quickly and easily and efficiently to disseminate a new case to my students by I simply posting, look, new case, you know, Jones versus Smith, 365 US 12, read it. And they click on it, it comes on their screen, they can read it, they can download it, they can print it, they can do whatever they want with it. And um, I mean, and it's just, it's a very easy and efficient way and I guess I should say that it's not obvious. As I said, this is integrated into Westlaw. This is part of Westlaw. So if your school has Westlaw and what law school doesn't, then you have Twin. If you don't pay for Twin, it's just it's part of Westlaw. I guess I assume that was obvious. A couple of other little ga gadgets. Um, for example, calendar. Uh, we got a lot of people said, I want to create a course calendar. I don't use it myself, but it's a very nice thing. All the students have, can read the calendar, but only the teacher can input into the calendar. Huh? What the students say, you know, class canceled, right? <laughs> you can only imagine. So you find the day you want. You can, you know, choose the month, choose the day. We're not going to bother you. We'll just click add, just for the fun of it. Uh, it looks like Outlook, I think, right? And you, you type whatever you want to type, and then it goes back on the calendar. Some people use this for the class assignments, for in legal research and writing, they use it a lot for when assignments are due and the whole of that sort of stuff. Um, email options. Um, when the course is, when you create the course and the students register for the course by, they simply put in their Westlaw password, they get to this web page, it says what school you in, well it knows what school you're in, you go to your school, Suffolk Law School, and it has a list of all the courses that have been created, and the students check off which ones they want to do, which reminds me. When you create the course, among the things you can do, if Karen and I are teaching two sections of civil procedure at the same law school, we could arrange it so that both of our students, our sections merge on Twin. Of course, that's also true if she's teaching in Suffolk and I'm teaching in Tulane. Or for that matter, if she's teaching in Leeds in England or in Hong Kong or anywhere in the world because it's all based on the internet. So you can connect classes very <coughs> easy, probably better to do with people who speak English, but not necessarily. In my advanced courses in labor law and employment discrimination, what I also do is I can add observers into my class. Ordinarily, the only people who can register for your course are students at your school. You can, by the way, exclude people, students in your school who are not in your class, because we all have the problem of people constantly barging in our classroom and trying to sit in our class when they haven't registered for it because they want to learn more. And so you probably want to exclude the hordes that are doing that. But if you want to, you can. But what you can also do is add people who are not in your school. For example, I sometimes add lawyers or judges. Uh, uh, Nichols in his bankruptcy course has bankruptcy judges who are part of his course. 
And if they have their own Westlaw password, all they have, all we have to do is put their Westlaw password in, and they're part of the course. We can give them rights just to, to read stuff or to read and post like everybody else. If they don't have a Westlaw password, we'll give them one. Although lawyers don't get excited, we won't give them a you know a Westlaw password that lets them do everything in Westlaw for free. It will only let them do twin stuff. But that's a very cool thing, and it's, it's when you create the course, you can do that very easily. Or if you want to modify the course, you can do that. Okay. So email options. Um, for some courses, you might want to send emails to a particular group of students, maybe if they're working in teams. And so you can set up kind of distribution lists like you probably have in your email system. This is nothing fabulous. It's nothing that you can't do through your email system. But if you happen to be in Twin and you want to do it through Twin, you can do it through Twin. It's just another email distribution list like you have in your, in your general email system. Uh, quizzes. Let's look at quizzes. Now, I've got to tell you one thing right up front. We haven't yet found a way to have twin grade an essay exam. When I do, believe me, somebody's paying big time, and I'm retired. <laughs> um, so we're obviously limited on what we can do. And it's objective kinds of things. Um, whether it's true or false or multiple choice or that sort of stuff, um, you can, and we won't go through all of the gory details, but you can imagine, you can create the quiz, you can edit the quiz, delete it. One of the nice things is when you create a quiz, for example, and let's just show a create a quiz for a second just so that you can create a quiz. Not only can you write out the question, okay, but in addition, um, let's say you have a question and there are four answers, A, B, C, and D. And then the student has to pick the right one. You can also input what you want the student to see after they make their choice. For example, um, you can just, you know, if, if, the, if the correct answer is C and they hit A, you can simply have something that says wrong. You know, or you can say A is not right because. And you can put in as much feedback as you want to put in. C is the right answer because, or just, you know, yes or no. Uh, let's forget about this. Let's go back. Just back, 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 back. Uh, the only other quiz results, uh, I'm not going to show you them, but, but that's a very good thing because you might want to know, well, what percentage got the question right? How many, what percentage answered A? How many answered B? How many answered C? What percentage answered D? Because that's helpful to me diagnostically to know where they are, just like my discussion forum, which helps them teach each other, also teaches me. Because if I see five questions on the discussion forum, all, all about X, and my guess is I screwed up when I was discussing it, so I'm going to go back to class the next time and say, you know, I, I was reading the discussion forum, I sort of did a lot of questions about X. Let's talk about it. So it also helps me get a deeper understanding of what's going on in the students' minds than I can get just by looking at them. The other part about this is the show hide. Uh, some uh, people, for example, might want to create all the quizzes at the beginning of the semester. They don't want the students to see them until you want them to see them. So you can hide them. Or you can show them. That's quizzes. Uh, web links I'm not going to show you. That's just what's obvious, the links to stuff on web. Westlaw Research, we won't go there, but if you click on that, it will simply take them to Westlaw. You don't have to shut down Twin. You just in the middle of Twin, you want to do some Westlaw research, you click that. The last thing I want to show you is West Newsly. This is very cool for me and for people like Professor Wu who do CLD stuff. This is a great, great thing. Watch this thing. What the folks at West have done is they've chosen, why is it the new one that's particular there? They've chosen the great, well, not all the great newspapers. They've chosen some newspapers and a whole bunch of business things. And every day, somebody or some people at West, I don't know who they are, are you then? Somebody calls out from these papers what they think lawyers are interested in, right? They find articles. Are these people in, in Taiwan who do this or Minnesota? All right, so I'm not sure that's a good thing. 
And so, if you clicked on one of those, you would, you know, you'd find today's legal highlights. Uh, I don't know how interesting that is because I know how much you can learn from the, you know, these these journals about stuff that's relevant to law. Maybe something. But if you can click that, no, let's scroll down a little bit. What's better, from my point of view, is it's also they also call out recent decisions from the state courts in all of the states and the federal courts. So, for example. When I'm about to do a CLE program for judges in the Sixth Circuit, I'm going to click on Sixth Circuit, which we're going to do right now. And it's going to show me very briefly, and often too briefly, I may have to click on here and I have to get the case, recent Sixth Circuit decisions. But I don't want to go through. There's a hundred of them here. I don't want to do that. So there's a drop-down list. And I can refine my search. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to look for labor and employment because that's what I do. And I'm going to click on Labor and Employment. And now I'm going to hit Go. And now I'm just going to see re recent Sixth Circuit cases, or if you're here, the First Circuit cases, on Labor and Employment. Or I could have done it on the state side with the state courts. Or I could do it for a district court. Or I could do it for the U.S. Supreme Court. I think this is very helpful for people who do this kind of thing. Not everybody does that, but I, I, I like it. I think that's pretty cool. Okay. What's the time frame? Well, let's scroll down and see. Let's just see for the fun of it. It starts June 4th. Let's just see. I don't know the answer. Let's see. Looks like two months. Looks like May and June. Now, I think if you scroll back up, that you can, I, I'm, I know you can because I've done it, you can go earlier. Uh, coverage. See where it says coverage? You can, you can go back. You can get more get more. Okay? We can close that window down. I think that's a pretty cool thing. Um, yeah, let's just go get the back. back uh, yeah, here we go. Um, the other stuff, when you when you create the course, besides asking for the name of the course, it asks what subject matter the course is. Okay, you give the name properly. They still ask you what subject area that is. So you got to pick the subject area. Because once you do that, it gives you the option to populate your course with stuff related to that subject area, not the least of which, appropriately so for this purpose, Cali lessons. You can use your twin course in civil procedure as a portal for the students to get access to the Cali lessons in civil procedure. And I can put them all in there, I can pick and choose, I can I, I can make it as refined or as not refined as I want. I'm not creating Cali lessons. I'm only giving them access to what already exists. And you can see I can choose which ones I want to put up there, and I can obviously change that from um, live discussion. This is something new. Nobody, you're the first human beings to see this. I mean, people in Minnesota have seen it, but you're the first human beings to see this. It's brand new. It's, a, it's available when? Uh, it's available starting in July. It's available starting July. There you go. Click on that. Live discussion. No, you can't. You're not going to see anything. Well, you can imagine what it is. It's chat. Mm -hmm. But... But this is, this is not available just for students to be chatting 24 hours a day. The professor is the one who has to create the chat opportunity. And, oh, you can see it. You can, you can set it up for a particular day and time, uh, and give it a title and all of that sort of stuff, and then set it up. And so then it becomes available for the students at that day and time. It's not, you know, unless you made it, unless you, every day you went in and created it for 24 hours, which nobody could do, it's not just, you know, online chat for fun for students. Uh, and then you get the box, you know, where they can read what other people are, are saying, and they can type in their own thing over here. You know how these chat boxes go. Um, and that's something new again, because we heard a lot of people who said, you know, it would be helpful if while I'm on the road, maybe I could actually do something with my class uh, through chat thing. So we put that up. It would be interesting to see how people use that or if they don't use it. Uh, let's scroll down a little bit more. Um, modify courses just to change all of the things I talked about. Add forms, delete forms, change the title of forms, uh, change the categories, ch change all sorts of stuff. Um, it's extremely uh, obvious and intuitive when you get in there. Uh, again, I didn't want to do anything that makes it difficult for anybody to use and, and have that be off putting. And finally, participants and usage. Uh, this has been a big improvement too. It used to be we had this thing in and you clicked it, and, and what you did is you said, okay, 
please send me stuff. And they would send an email to West in Minnesota, and eventually they'd send you back, you know, six or eight months later, the data that you asked for. And that wasn't very useful. Now it's automatic. I mean, Not you, quite 16. Okay, so it was two days. It's basically the same. <laughs> Use course participants, I like to do this just for the fun. Because I, I, I make, as I told you, I make it totally uh, optional, which I do. But I like to see, just for my own curiosity. Not so much whether Joe Smith or Jane Smith is in, but I'm, I'm curious how many. And I always have 100%. I always have 100% of the people registered. But more than that, um, besides few participants, which is of limited use, I mean, once you've seen it, you've seen it. The other thing, in, uh, is not just participants, but usage. And if we can, Justin, if we can go back to that, um, you can get usage statistics, uh, view course usage statistics, and that's and you you have all these options. Now you tell us what you want, and you get it. And when do you get it back? Immediately. There you go. Uh, just to give you an idea. In, over the years, we have about, on an average, about 20 some odd courses on Twin at Tulane in any one semester. Uh, and frankly, if students haven't used Twin before, they're more likely to use it if they're first year students than if they're not. Because after the first year, they are learning and studying and experiential patterns are pretty much solidified. So it's helpful to start with. But those who have as first year students tend to pressure their upper class teachers to have it because they have found it useful. On the average, uh, in my experience, uh, and mine is totally optional, when, I, when we add up all of the postings that students make, and we divide by the number of students and divide by the number of days and all of that, on the average, on the average, each student is going into Friedman's civil procedure class in Twin and doing something, reading or posting, I, I don't differentiate on the average of twice per day. Twice per day. Twice per day. Uh, because it doesn't take them long to get in. And in fact, if we, if we can go into my discussion form, you'll see you know, the times that they post. I mean, what you would expect from students, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, all kinds of times. That's the beauty of this. They can do it when they want, and I can do it when I want. And two years ago, when I had infants and I was up all the time, I was posted at 3 o'clock in the morning. So that's kind of what it is. Try to make it simple. Try to make it easy. Try to make it um, responsive to what the students and the faculty have told us they want. Uh, and 150 schools using it, Somebody must be getting something out of it. Uh, and, and the fact that so many of my students use it tells me that I, I ought to continue to do it because they obviously find it useful. By the way, not everybody does it on a voluntary basis. I know many professors across the country who have required assignments on Twin and they require students to do certain things on Twin. And obviously, you can do it that way by not uh, making it anonymous. And as Justin told you, when you create the course, you can eliminate the option for anonymity so that they don't have the opportunity to be anonymous. Questions? Comments. Uh, everybody wants to eat. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Did you do any um, demos to students before they did the course? Or do you no. Just to do whatever? Well, uh, what we do, um, we have a freshman orientation, first year, first year orientation, and in that we bring everybody to our lab and we show them how to do email, we show them how to log on to the network, and we register them for Twin because invariably every single first year student. Uh, but I have never spent any time in special on how to use it now. It's, there's nothing to, I mean, I tell them lawschool.westlaw.com, click Twin, and take it from there. And, I mean, you know where my level of expertise is. Theirs is a lot higher than mine. But they don't have to. There are some online tutorials if you do have an interest in having something available. Oh, yeah. Things. And we have manuals and all that kind of stuff, online and otherwise. But, I, but, I, but do I personally instruct them? I don't. And, I, and I've never had a student say, what's twin? You can't figure it out. Yes, sir.
set the begin and end registration dates to specific dates. Um, we, we do it by default, by, I think there's four selections, a full year, fall semester, spring semester, and summer. But that's just how it appears on the page, you can modify that. When you create the course, it asks, the day this course begins is that's so, the day it ends is thus and so. So you can put in any date you want. I'm just wondering, I've, I've used automatically, right? We're in, this is a beta, which starts on Monday at law school, beta.weston.com. You can use this. Your current content, we share the same SQL back now. Your content is shared between this interface and the old interface. And come the fall, everything you've done in the past looks like it does here. Okay. I think she means how, to, how can she transfer if I her content? Some of the stuff yeah, she wants to transfer her content. Oh, you want to just update your class? There's, yeah, there's a tool for something. On the front of the page, remember your class is, say, inactive or archived or has passed the registration date? You do that. There are some tools on here for updating the course. Here's an idea. No, the reason this says this course is now inactive is when I created the course and it said the semester begins on such and such a date, that, that date is come and gone. So it, it's still there. Anybody can use it. it. They just put this title on it. I think, Karen, your question is, if you teach a course last fall, and now you want to take some of that content and put it on the course this coming fall, how do you do that? You can update the class. You can do things like removing your former participants. You can change the name. You can change the duration. Okay. You can you keep all the postings, all the remove all the old students. Students. Yeah. postings. Yeah. Right. And change I this course now. What happens to that course once you? Yeah. Well, no, it's there. Have the data there it's as long as you want. It's up to you to remove it. Nice. See, that's another. You see, if it was in my law school. I'd be telling my professors, get that stuff off the server because I only have so much memory on my server. But they got gazillions of bagillions of bytes, and they're not worried about storage up there at West. So you can keep your stuff on there for a long time. <laughs> they got a lot of money, you know? They're so making all that money off my book that they're not giving to me, you know? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Can you post PowerPoint on slideshows on this? Yes. Yes, you can. Is there a simple way to do that? It's yeah. the same. Same way that you would update any other file that you saw earlier, the attached file, there's a browse button. You just search for it on your hard drive, your floppy drive. You select it, you hit submit, and we'll convert it and post the images right on the, right on the page for you. Some of those. Yeah, if, if, the, if, the, if the file is really large, if there's like 50 slides, you're converting all those into a JPEG. And some of the JPEGs can be very heavy and heavy and intensive memory. So the larger the file, the longer it takes to, for your students to open it. That's why some people do not convert to HTML. They just have a post and open it. They and attach it. They, they attach, attach it file, and they download it. Then they download it and they open up the computer. Okay. Yeah, one other specific question. If I have a table that I created in Word, in your experience, does that translate pretty clearly without getting from it? Tables seem to work better in the conversion than just straight text. Yeah. But try it. I'm not saying that straight text is a, is a failure. It's just it's more it's, it's more solid with the tables. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all very very much. Thank you.